Hello everyone watching. This presentation is based around some various uh, D-Day leaders that we're going to discuss today. It was put together by Group 4, whose members consist of Jose Serna, Luke Sessler, Mike Stone, Vanessa Vinton, Marquise Wilson, and Richard Wilmer. The leaders we will be covering today are General Eisenhower, General Smith, also known as Beetle, and Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory. Some of the key leader topics we're going to be discussing during this presentation include shadows of leadership, elements of leadership, and last but not least, the ethical climates. It's apparent that General Eisenhower, General Smith, and Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory had leadership roles. Shadows of leadership sometimes occur when the actions of a leader rub off on those beneath them, thus casting a shadow. So let's get into each of our selected D-Day leaders. For General Eisenhower, we're going to talk about the shadow of power. General Eisenhower was the supreme commander and had obvious power just from the title of his position. However, he was able to utilize a soft power approach, attracting people to follow him instead of forcing it. But let's not forget, General Eisenhower was the supreme commander, and he had legitimate power by position alone. What made General Eisenhower so special was not necessarily his title or how he carried his power, but instead his referent power, by which he was able to be a role model and have other officers and enlisted personnel look up to him. The first thing that comes to mind for General Beadle Smith is the shadow of privilege. In the military, they have a saying, rank has its privileges. This holds true for General Smith. The trust between Eisenhower and Beadle seemed unshakable. General Smith knew most of General Eisenhower's intimate details and what he was thinking. What set General Smith apart was his ability to always know General Eisenhower's true intentions. This is probably due to the fact that Eisenhower and Smith spent a lot of time together both professionally and socially. Besides having a privilege to information, General Smith had excess amounts of leisure with General Eisenhower, as well as the ability to eat very well, that is, in comparison to your average soldier. Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory took a positive approach to the shadow of misplaced or broken loyalties. We can learn a great deal from Lee Mallory and his desire and ability to put his own troops first. He showed great concern to everyone about the amount of soldiers he would potentially be losing on D-Day. He also stressed the importance of getting troops ashore as quickly as possible in order to support his men flying in. Throughout planning for D-Day, he was either asking to reconsider landing his troops or asking support from tanks to ensure a quick assault. However, when given the final command by Eisenhower to continue the mission, he acted on his orders without hesitation. All right, next we'll be talking about different elements of leadership and some of the qualities that our D-Day leaders possessed. General Eisenhower displayed three critical character elements throughout the movie Ike, Countdown to D-Day. The elements are reverence, wisdom, and prudence, and courage to assume responsibility. There is one portion of the movie in which General Eisenhower took full responsibility for the failure of the Allied assault, so other high-ranking officials would be spared the humility, but more so to maintain order and ensure a future. The display of courage that General Eisenhower displayed was the classic belief of the greater good and sacrifice one for the many. General Eisenhower was always listening to his command staff and valuing, valuing their opinion. Moreover, he would always weigh every option for the decisions that he needed to make. Irrational decision making was not General Eisenhower's game to play. His actions, beliefs, and morality are reasons why he became General of the Army. General Smith displayed three critical character elements throughout the movie. These elements were justice, integrity, and courage to serve. General Smith displayed integrity throughout the entire film, always staying true to himself and his team. He was General Eisenhower's hatchet man, 
making the true gut calls in order to stay on task, but also being a kindred spirit when needed. General Smith had the ability to get his hands dirty, but stay true to the cause. I believe the reason why General Eisenhower was so successful was because of his friends, allies, and peers to whom he served with. Like Tom Selleck said in the movie portraying General Eisenhower, Churchill was right. I am the most powerful man in the world. But it is up to the corporal on Utah Beach and up to the private on Omaha Beach who will decide the outcome of this war. Now, I am just a spectator. Air Vice Marshal Mallory displayed three critical character elements. These elements were courage to serve, justice, and reverence. Air Vice Marshal Mallory was such a critical character because of how he carried himself, his presence, and his actions. Air Vice Marshal Mallory and General Eisenhower did not always see eye to eye, but they shared respect for the overall mission success for the Allied forces, and that's what kept the team together. Reverence is displayed when he discussed the air operations with Eisenhower. Although Lee Mallory did not want to send his troops in with a 70% casualty rate, he later came to truth with himself, understanding that the ground forces obtaining a foothold on the beaches were the decisive elements to Operation Overload. Justice and courage to serve can be seen in the character throughout this movie. I believe that the character displayed by the Air Vice Marshal was because of his upbringing in the British Army, where respect and nobility are actions of gentlemen. One can see how the Air Vice Marshal was heartbroken on aspects of the opera of the operation. However, due to his role, he was able to focus on the overall goal and come to terms on what needs to happen in order to succeed. All right, as we transition into the last part of this presentation, we're going to be discussing the ethical climates of each of our leaders, which correlated with how the unit functioned and ultimately resulted in their success. For General Eisenhower, we're looking at three specific criteria that really shaped the, the climate. Process focus, integrity, and trust. For process focus, General Eisenhower did what great leaders do. He assessed and analyzed the situation. He used his team to make the best informed decision. He had numerous personnel, both land and air, to assist him with the overall mission. His intent was to keep the casualties the lowest possible and just to make the mission successful. An example of this was as he prepped for the final stages of D-Day, General Eisenhower consulted his weather advisor in order to decide to invade the beach or not. General Eisenhower and his team were glorified for the in-depth analytical research and level of detail that went into planning their missions. Integrity. Leaders have to make hard decisions. As a man in the position of General Eisenhower, he had the ability to make many decisions that could affect various matters. A prime example of this when General Eisenhower's best friend from West Point was caught divulging classified information in the eyes of the public. Even with their personal relationship, he had to uphold that climate, and he had to make the call to relieve him of his duties and send him home. To be relieved in a combat environment is probably one of the worst things that can happen to any military personnel, regardless of rank. Lastly, trust. The fact that the world leaders trusted General Eisenhower to lead the Allied powers is a great responsibility. We know that there's skepticism with any organization, especially one with diverse cultures and backgrounds that General Eisenhower had to lead. For ethical climate, we're looking at two criteria for General Smith, social responsibility and addressing the underlying factors. As the chief of General Eisenhower's staff, General Beadle needed to be in sync with the leader's intent. Although they did not always see eye to eye on the same things, General Beadle always vetted his controls and thoughts to General Eisenhower. One might not see the direct social responsibility, but always remember there are second and third order effects to everything. General Beadle continued to urge General Eisenhower to speak to the public and face what's going on. General Eisenhower did not want to face the public, but 
General Beadle knew and understood that it was owed to the American people, as many men put their lives in danger. Eventually, General Beadle would address the public. When it comes to addressing the underlying factors, we must understand that there will always be morally good and bad leaders. A leader must capture this type of behavior and address it. General Beadle confronts the issues of General Patton. His remarks in regards to Anglo-Saxon superiority make it hard for General Eisenhower to send him home. General Beadle offers his insight. Although General Eisenhower allows him to stay, General Beadle doesn't say anything. But the matter is addressed about the behaviors that may cause issues later. All right, last but not least, we have Air Vice Marshal Lee Mallory. Two of the critical factors that went into ethical climate were integrity and justice. As they were discussing the plan for jumpers, Mallory said, a wounded jumper is a cripple and that the weather was a big deal. If the jumpers are hurt, they will be very susceptible to casualties. He was committed to the mission and not afraid to bring it up. He was supportive, even with the likelihood of devastating losses. Mallory also valued decision-making, goal-setting, and sharing information, even as unpleasant as it was. Lastly, justice. Mallory was right to voice his concern when he offered clear explanations for use of resources, which in this case were his jumpers. He expressed them in advance and voiced his expectations and what they would potentially encounter. Mallory was also just in the fact that he dealt truthfully with the other generals and planning members. Those estimates were high, he was honest throughout the entire process, and it did not make the decision to proceed with Operation Overload any easier. The final action, however, is when he apologized for adding to the worry of Eisenhower's decision. Now the estimates were far less than 20% for casualties. His apology was not necessarily public, but it was still directed to Eisenhower himself.